Hello! Welcome back to my channel. I'm Kat. This is Kat Makes, and today we are here for part two of my Learn Tambor Embroidery series where we're actually going to be forming the first stitches, and I'm so stinking excited about this. I can't wait. I've been sewing for basically my whole life, and I've been making all of my own clothes exclusively, so not buying ready-to-wear from stores since 2016, and I learned tambour embroidery as part of the process of making my own wedding dress starting in 2017. If you want the longer version of that background, and also, very importantly, the supply list and the things you need to start with tambour embroidery, go back and watch part one. Without further ado, let's jump right in. The coolest part about tambour embroidery, well, I don't know if I can narrow it down to just one coolest part about tambour embroidery, but one of the coolest parts about tambour embroidery is that it's all one stitch. Tambour embroidery is a chain stitch through fabric, and all of the beads and all of the sequins and embellishments and gorgeous threads that you see used in tambour embroidery examples are all boiled down to that one single stitch, that one single chain stitch. So if you're familiar with crochet, it's exactly the same, except it's happening through a base layer of fabric. And the cool thing about that from a learning perspective is you only have one thing to learn with tambour embroidery. You only have this one stitch, right? And once you master that one stitch, it is a little tricky because your hands are going to be making new motions and you're going to be making new connections in your brain, right? But once you learn that one stitch, once you get through the hurdles and the snagging fabric and the tension regulation and all of that, the rest of it is just artistic expression, right? The opportunities are endless, and I just think that's the coolest thing ever. So we're going to learn our one stitch today, our chain stitch, and that stitch is formed using the tambour embroidery tool. I went over this tool briefly in the last video. It is comprised of two parts. So you have the handle of the tambour embroidery tool or tambour embroidery hook, and you have the business end, the needle or the hook itself. The needle or hook that I'm going to show you in a moment how to affix to this handle is basically just a little teeny tiny crochet hook that's the size of a sewing machine needle. And there are a lot of different reasons why you choose to use different sizes of these, but for now in the context of just stitching alone, what you're wanting is for the thread that you're using to be able to travel easily through the needle. So if you're using a smaller needle, you'll be using a thinner width of thread, and if you're using a larger needle, you'll be using a thicker width of thread, like a silk embroidery thread, for example. How the needle is mounted in the handle is also very important, right? So if we take this needle out of the handle, we're left with just the handle itself, which has this little wooden end, and it also has this brass tip on it, which is called a ferrule, and the ferrule has a knob pointing out of it. Here's a closer look at the handle of that tool. You can see the wooden end, and then the ferrule, which is this brass bit, and then the knob, and then if you turn it on its end, you can see the hole where you'll be inserting the hook. So let's grab that hook and take a quick look at that. The hook is very similar to a crochet hook the size of a sewing needle. The biggest difference is it has a really, really pointed tip instead of the blunt tip that a crochet hook has, which is useful for piercing the fabric. So we're going to insert this into the handle with the knob loose, and the trick here is to make sure that the business end of the hook, so the hooky part of the hook, is lined up with the knob of the tambour embroidery hook. And this is going to be an indicator for us when the hook is in the fabric, because you won't be able to see the tip, but you need to know which end is facing forward. So take your time with this, turn it to both sides, turn it to the Back and make sure that it is perfectly aligned with that knob facing forward. And then once you're done with that, give it an extra little tighten and you're good to stitch. How you hold the hook is also really important. So we're going to hold it in our dominant hand and it's sort of a pencil-like grip, right? So if I were holding it like a pencil, it would look something like this, but I'm actually going to tilt it forward, right? So it's, we're holding it a little bit more like this. And the goal is we want it to be as close to perpendicular to the fabric as possible. So when we're actually stitching as close to perpendicular as possible, and we're actually gonna be rotating the hook like this in between our thumb and our index finger as we form the stitch. That's part of the stitch formation that we're gonna to get to in a minute. So you wanna be able to, when you're just holding it before you do any stitching, sort of practice rolling it in between your index finger and your thumb. That's gonna make a lot more sense when you're actually forming the stitches, but just keep in mind, as perpendicular to the fabric as possible. Next up, I want to add super quickly just about thread selection, which I know I should have done in the supply list video, but I did forget. This is just a Guterman all-purpose sewing thread, so 100% polyester, the kind of thing you'd put through your sewing machine. This is fine for learning. I don't generally stitch my projects with uh, all-purpose sewing thread, but some people that I know who do timber embroidery do, so it's totally up to you. It's totally fine for learning either way. Just make sure that you're choosing a high-quality all-purpose sewing thread rather than something that's a little bit lower on the quality spectrum because those ones will be a little bit fuzzy and a little bit more prone to snagging. 
the threads that I do use are either Guterman hand quilting thread, which is a glazed cotton thread. It's a little bit on the thicker side, but it's really great and very strong, or Filagant by Saju. So that's what that looks like. Filagant is exactly the same kind of glazed cotton thread, except it's a lot thinner than the Guterman, which makes it a lot easier for working with the smaller beads that I enjoy. And Saju also makes a Fila Kudra, which is this little guy here. That's just a metallic version of the same uh, weight of thread. So I like Saju's Filagant and Fila Kudra threads, and I also like Guterman hand quilting thread. You can use all-purpose thread if you would like to starting out, that's totally fine. Also, I have a little friend who would like to say hello. This is Theo's sister, Stella. She is very slowly learning how to not chase spools of thread across the sewing room. We are working on it. So now that we have the hook mounted in the handle of our tambour embroidery tool, and we've hopefully selected what thread we're going to use, we are going to move on to making the basic stitch. Before I show you this with the actual tambour embroidery hook, I'm going to ramp up the scale. So this is a crochet hook and some mesh fabric, and I'm going to be using some four-ply yarn as well. So we're going to take that looped over the end of our finger, hold it under your frame in your non-dominant hand so that you can hold the hook in your dominant hand, and then just pierce the fabric with your hook and use it to pull that thread up so that you no longer have a loop. So you have a little tail on the top and your working thread is underneath. And I'm just going to use a pin to set that off to the side. We can weave that end in later, but basically we're just securing that end so that it doesn't start to unravel before we're ready to start stitching. Hold your hook in your dominant hand, vertically like a pencil, and then I like to tension the working thread around my pinky like this. You can tension it however you like, we just need a little bit of control over that thread. And then to form the stitch, we're going to insert the hook in the direction that we wish to stitch in, so the direction of travel, wrap the thread around the hook, rotate the hook back so that it's opposite the direction of travel, and pull up. So again, insert in the direction of travel, wrap the thread around, rotate the hook, and then pull back up through the fabric. Each time you pull your hook up through the fabric, you'll have a new little loop, and the next stitch is all about carrying that loop forward so that the next loop can come up through it. So it is just a chain stitch. Next, we're going to change direction. I'm going to go off to the right, and I'm going to show you here how you're going to continue to insert the hook in the direction of travel, always the direction of travel, wrap, and then rotate and pull your hook back up opposite the direction of travel. When you're pulling that hook up, you can push against the back of the head of the hook to clear a little space for the fabric so that you don't snag your hook. Here's a slightly different angle. Again, same thing. Insert, wrap, rotate, pull, and then rotate again so that you're always inserting in the direction of travel and pulling up opposite the direction of travel. As you practice this more, the rotation of the hook and the wrapping of the thread will become one fluid motion, but if it helps when you're starting, you can just sort of separate those and do one step at a time. And now let's have a look at what this looks like in actual timbre embroidery size. So here's our timbre embroidery hook, which we prepared earlier, and then I'm also using the Saju Filagant thread for this. So this is just black so that you can very clearly see what's going on, and we're going to follow exactly the same technique here. I've got a loop of the end of the thread around my finger. I like to keep my spool in a little bowl off to the side so it doesn't run away, and we're just going to pull that tail up once again using the hook so that we can pin it out of the way. And this is, again, just temporary so that nothing unravels before we're ready to start stitching, but we'll just insert the pin out of the way on our fabric and then wrap that thread around a couple of times just to make sure that nothing is going to unravel and cause any problems, and we can come back and weave this in later. Here I'm going to tension my thread exactly the same way you saw me do earlier around my pinky finger and then hang on to it pinched between my thumb and index finger and then forming the stitch is exactly the same. We're going to insert the hook in the direction of travel, wrap, rotate, and here the rotation is really easy to see because you can see how that hook follows the face of the needle. So we're inserting in the direction of travel, wrapping the thread around, rotating it, and then pulling that new loop back up through the fabric. And here it's really important when you're pulling that loop up through the fabric to make sure that you're pushing against the back of the head of the hook because that is going to help clear a little space so that you don't have any little snags while you're working. And I'll just change direction again so that you can see that we are always inserting the hook in the direction of travel and pulling it back up in the direction opposite. And you can also see as I continue to stitch through here that the rotation of the hook and the wrapping of the thread does start to become one fluid motion. It won't be this fluid for you when you're just starting out, but keep practicing and make sure that you're taking breaks and coming back to it if you get frustrated because uh, it definitely helps. 
As you're practicing, just change directions a lot, get comfortable with how the stitch is formed, focus on keeping your tension consistent and the size of your stitches consistent, which is particularly important with beads. And I'm just going to show you real quick what happens when you don't push against the back of the needle to allow a little space. So if I just insert the hook and try to pull it directly up without pushing against the back, it gets snagged. You can see it's snagging on the fabric. But if I use my index finger to push against the back of the head, it will clear the fabric easily. So again, snagging when there's no pushing. But if you use your index finger pushing against the handle, you can clear a little space for the hook to pass through. As always, please let me know in the comments if you have questions. I am going to preemptively address a couple of questions and common troubleshooting suggestions that I get from people learning tambour embroidery. So the first is thread tension issues, right? One of the reasons I suggest organzo as a fabric to learn on for tambour embroidery is that you can stretch the ever-loving daylights out of it, and then when you take it back off the frame or out of the hoop, it tends not to pucker, which can be really unfortunate when you spent all that work on a piece and it ends up puckering at the end. If you're having issues with your fabric puckering despite using organza, especially if the fabric is puckering as you work, so you can sort of see it shrinking in on the frame the more beads you add or the more stitches you add, probably what's happening is that your thread tension is too tight. And I'm really sorry that I'm going to sound like your mother when I give you this piece of advice, but the best piece of advice I have for this is to relax your shoulders. I know that sounds silly, but you're holding the tension in your shoulders, especially as you're learning. This is exactly what happened to me. You're holding the tension in your shoulders. You're like, everything's really, really tight and it's coming down into your hands and you're gripping that thread and you just need to... I, it, <laughs> It all comes from the shoulders, right? So relax your shoulders a little bit and through that your hands will relax and the thread will be able to travel more easily between your fingers. Another thing that can help with this is to make sure that when you're pulling that loop back up through the fabric, pull that loop a little larger, a little longer than you want it to, and then pull it slightly back down before you make your next stitch. You're pulling a little bit more out than you need and then just tightening it up enough to form that next stitch. So we don't want to be stitching so tightly that we end up with that fabric pulling in on itself as the stitches are formed. Remember that your hands are learning something for the first time here, right? This little rolling motion with the tool is something that your brain has never had to do before, right? And this rolling and then pulling and the thread all at the same time, there's a lot going on. It can be really stressful and frustrating. One of the things that I found really valuable when I was learning and that surprised me when I was learning was there was a lot of value in just setting it down when I got frustrated and coming back to it the next day or coming back to it in a few hours after my brain had had time to process and think about that a little bit more. You would be amazed at the amount of thinking that your brain does about something like this when you're not actively sitting in front of it. So if you feel yourself getting frustrated or you feel like you're about to hit a brick wall, just put it down, go do something else fun for a while, come back, the tool will be here, I will be here to help you, and you will get it. Eventually your brain will click and you will be magically making these stitches and progressing to more complex designs and it'll be so exciting for both of us. I can't wait for you to experience it. it. It was amazing when I did and I am confident that you can do it as well. Another thing going back to that tension conversation, even if you're not having thread tension issues, when we learn things and when we're focusing, we kind of do kind of tend to tense up a little bit. So make sure you're taking lots of breaks. Make sure you're rolling your shoulders. Make sure you're stretching your neck, all of those things. I don't want you sitting down in one place and trying to learn this thing in six hours without moving or anything like that. Take a lap every 20 minutes. Go drink some water. Your brain will continue to work on it while you're away having that snack. Make sure to stop and stretch, okay? Right, so that is the end of lesson number two, your very first stitches in tambour embroidery. Next video, we're going to add beads. There's two different ways that we can add beads with tambour embroidery, and I'm really excited to see which one is your preference, because I certainly have mine. But you're going to have to stick around if you want to watch that third video, because it's still on the way. In the meantime, if you want to see what I'm up to with tambour embroidery and all the other little projects that I'm working on, you can follow me at cat.makes on both TikTok and Instagram, and you can check out my blog, catmakes.com, and obviously also pretty Pretty, pretty please subscribe if you want to watch the next video and also watch some of the old ones if you'd like. Also if you are making progress on your journey with tambour embroidery because of my videos or the other things I've posted I would really love to see it if you want to tag me in any of those places that would absolutely make my day. Anyways thank you so much for watching make sure you're subscribed so you know when that next video comes out and I hope you have a lovely day. Bye!